really come from a long line of teachers. My father was a high school educator for about 35 years and my brother is a college professor. So I guess you could say it's in the blood a little bit, but I knew I had a real passion for history and social studies and I also had a passion for working with kids. And so when I graduated college and when I was working in college, I, I knew that this was gonna be a way to really be able to give back uh, and that it was gonna be a very rewarding career uh, and I think I was definitely influenced by having great teachers throughout my life and really looking at them and saying I want I want to be a role model like like they were for me for for kids that I teach uh, and I feel really privileged to be able to do that. I became a teacher because uh, I always admired my own teachers. As a high school student I spent most of my time at school uh, whether it was forensics which is public speaking uh, Drama Club, Madrigals, which is Renaissance Singers, AP uh, courses. I spent so much time there as an athlete, and I saw what my, my teachers gave up for me, and I felt that it was my duty to give back. So from the time that I was a ninth grader in high school, um, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, I knew that I needed to devote my life to making high school that same place it had been for me for a new generation of students. I didn't want to be a teacher leaving high school. I had some amazing teachers growing up. I wanted to be a doctor and I went to college and I started taking literature courses and a friend of mine made me fall in love with literature. She just made me fall in love with words. So I said, I think I'm going to teach literature. I found that I interacted well with young people and it was great. Additionally, in undergraduate school, I was not prepared. And while I wasn't embarrassed by teachers, I often felt that I didn't know things that the rest of my classmates knew. And I never wanted students to feel like that. The interest for teaching began when I started working at a national nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Um, I was in charge of a program where I was working with a group of students in an inner city school. And with working with them, I got to see just the opportunity to engage with them and to see what exposing them to different skills, different um, you know, different things that they had never done before, how exciting that was. And then also just working with them, I began to see really, I really enjoyed working with kids. Watching my mother growing up, she also is a teacher um, for DeKalb County Schools and she worked with students with disabilities. And growing up in our home, she cared for the students, she brought them home with us, um, and they were just part of the family. And so, quite natural, I saw her love and her passion for um, teaching these students. I decided to further, you know, myself as I became older and say, hey, I want to be a teacher as well. And um, another thing, I remember um, Atherton Elementary School, where I attended elementary school, I was in Dr. Car Carolyn English's class. And she allowed me to be the um, teacher leader for the day. And that being the teacher leader inspired me to just um, feel like I could, you know, control a little bit, uh, lead a little bit, direct a little bit. And so that day forth, I dressed as a teacher um, every day for career day, elementary school, middle school, high school. And then I just continue to uh, follow my path and my dream of just wanting to be a teacher. This is the 16th year of my teaching career and I still really have the same energy. Uh, I'm wiser, so I know how to harness it a little better <laughs> than when I was a young teacher, a uh, younger teacher. But I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I think that my students realize that I'm sincere in the attention that I give them. I'm, I'm sincere with making them ready for college. My teaching style is a combination of routine and risk. From the framework of routine, uh, for instance, we can do opening activities. Uh, for instance, every Monday we take a look at an image and we'll tie this, this unfamiliar image into our unit of study. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday we'll do SAT problems and break them down logically. Uh, Wednesday we talk about archetypal theory. Um, Fridays we do a, a brief writing assessment where we talk about what we learned over the week. So those are routines that kids can expect. And kids can expect that in the same point in class often similar things will happen. Like there's a point in class where I'll hand out some of their graded work and we'll discuss. Um, they know the last minute or two of classes, announcements and reminders. There's a shape of the class that feels the same on most days. Within the framework of routine, that allows for more free play, where when we talk about things like, let's say, um, Shakespeare's Othello, 
I'll give the students an open-ended question and it's up to them to discuss it and I'll only act as a facilitator and they know that they need to speak with each other and take turns and not raise their hands um, and that's something I'm, I'm working with you know with them a lot and if there's a teachable moment if there's something that feels perhaps like a digression at first but really does have some material to it that relates to our unit of study or relates to something they need you know uh, college preparation life preparation literacy um, things like bias you know in the media we'll go there and we'll, we'll take a little trip down that road and then we'll pull it back so to me that is that's the the best way to, to set up learning is to give kids routines and give them a, a safe consistent structure that they can bank on so they, they feel comfortable but then within that routine to to play and uh, move around and take risks. I'm able to take anything that I want the students to learn and give them a story that relates to their lives. Uh, I like to think of myself as kind of a storyteller so the amazing thing for me is I just tell them stories and I make them relate to whatever they are learning. I also let them know that everything I'm going to teach them they already know. Now they may not know the name of the term, they may not know where it came from, but they already know it. I just have to make it plain for them. Just being actively involved in what's going on in the classroom, keeping up to date on technology, incorporating as much technology I can into the classroom, making the learning exciting and engaging, finding out new teaching styles and um, new strategies. I try to stay up to date with that. Teaching is not something you can just kind of sit on and just say, you know, what I know is always what's going to work. It's not. It's something that you're just constantly having to adapt to learn new methods, you know, find out what's going on. So I think um, my style in that sense too is adaptable. I'm not um, stagnant with that. I always try to make sure that um, I can bring whatever I need to in order to the classroom. I gotta meet these new Common Core standards, so I've gotta find new ways to reach these students through these standards. I really want to make them active learners, so it's very important for me that they're not sitting passively for 90 minutes in a desk, that we're moving around, that we're discussing, uh, that we're working in group activities, that they're challenging the content that I'm giving them, uh, and that they're also challenging me and I think that's what makes memorable lessons. And I, I try to do that with every piece of content that I teach. I try to figure out how can I make this memorable for the students? Not just so they'll learn it for the next test, but that years from now, they'll come back and say, I remember when we did this in class, and I remember that lesson. Um, to me, that's when tr teachers truly make an impact, is when their students can't just memorize something for a test, but that they can remember it years later and hopefully apply it and also see the value in it. I'm a big fan of, I always tell my students, I, I really despise busy work. If there's not a purpose to it, we shouldn't be doing it. And so I always try to plan my lessons with that in mind, that if it's not valuable to my students, it's not valuable for my time or for their time. And to me, I think that pushes me on a daily basis to think of interactive ways to present the content. Think of fun ways that's going to make them want to come to this class uh, and want to challenge themselves in a rigorous environment, but still enjoying the content and also being able to apply it to real world situations. To teachers who are struggling to reach their students, to make sure that they don't isolate themselves. Sometimes it's embarrassing to admit that you don't have control of a class. Uh, that was me my first year of teaching. Um, I had to really learn fast how to, how to get a class under just some order. Um, sometimes it's sad to know that you're not reaching them with the material. Um, you'll give a test or quiz and, and you're stunned at, at the student's um, lack of preparation or, or comprehension of the material and so that can be embarrassing. So sometimes when, when teachers feel embarrassed they withdraw and they hide. Um, that's the quickest way to fail. It's, it's, it takes a great deal of humility and it takes a great deal of resilience. But something that, that helped me a lot as a young teacher and an inexperienced teacher was um, being recorded. Now that's easier than ever with all of our fancy phones. Um, if you just can have the humility to record yourself and watch it, it will likely be slightly painful and uncomfortable to do so. Wow, do I say um that often? So you watch it and you start to see maybe some ways that your delivery might be suffering. Uh, that's, a, that's a good way to start, but also do things like um, find educational improvement networks like, uh, like PD60 out of 360 out of Utah. Uh, look at other teachers teaching. Visit the teachers that uh, have great reputations that the students say they really learn from. Um, that's the best way to spend your planning period as a struggling teacher, is just to go observe others. Even to 20 minute observation will teach you so much about maybe what you're doing wrong. The highlight for any day is is really seeing that light click in a student's eyes. 
and seeing where a student gets that content that I'm trying to, to give them. And I think on a daily basis, that's always what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I, I think that's really the goal, is if I can do that, and, and hopefully not in just one student, but in, in most of my students, if not all of them. Uh, I get really passionate by trying to create new content and new lesson plans that uh, I think will, my students will enjoy and also learn a lot from. So I make it a point every year to really evaluate what I've done the previous year and see where I can improve. I think teachers can get in the habit of saying, well, this lesson has worked for five years, so it'll work this year. And sometimes they're right, but sometimes we don't bring the same passion to it the sixth or seventh time we're teaching it, we're, we're teaching it, and students can see that. And so for me, it's important to sort of shake up my, my lineup, so to speak, of, of activities. And to say, I'm not gonna do this this year, I'm gonna think of a new activity that's better. That's more work, but I feel like if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't look forward to coming to school. I think that keeps me, when I have a new lesson and I think it's going to work, I can't wait to get to school. And one, see if it works, because it doesn't always work. Sometimes I have great lessons, or I think I have great lessons, and they fall flat on their face. But when it works and you say, this is worth the time that I've put into it and kids are getting it and not only are they getting it today, they're gonna remember this. They're gonna recall this for whatever an assessment we have, but also hopefully pass this course and remember this year from, from years on. Organization is very important. You have to pretty much know what you're talking about, know exactly what you want to teach and you have to set these things up in advance. So what I do before I leave, I always make sure that the classroom is set before the next morning because you never know if you're going to be running late, how you're going to come in. And so I prepare everything down to making the, sure the pencils are sharpened, the copies are made, the books are ready to go, the tables are nice and clean for the students. And then I let them know at the end of the day what to be expected the next day. Um, I do know things happen, changes come, and then we just you know, follow those hurdles or cross those hurdles when it come. But for the most part, uh, we plan accordingly. And I let the students know that, you know, this is what is expected. And I teach rituals and routines from day one. That also helps with the organization process of keeping the classroom organized in order. I think the number one thing that has to be addressed is the size of classrooms uh, and, and the amount of students in classrooms. I think the number one thing is students having access to their teachers. Uh, in some of our classes that get above 30 and 35 and sometimes 38 or 40 students, what we lose as teachers is that one-on-one -on -one interaction. The single greatest challenge that are facing our teachers is um, some teachers not understanding their own worth and the impact that they have on the lives of students. I know there are other challenges going around um, in our world that affect directly teachers, but I think the most important one would be just teachers not understanding their own worth and understanding um, the importance of educating the students no matter what um, challenges come our way, pay cuts, um, changes in um, job descriptions. Um, lack of resources or just whatever challenges teachers have individually, we still have to remember our main purpose of teaching the students. The buzzword is differentiation, like you have to change the things you want to do for each student. Uh, but at the end of all of that, what you really need to do is just raise your expectations for every student. The expectation for my AP students, while they may be working on different material, the expectation is that you do your work, you come see me if you struggle. The ninth grade students is the same. I make sure that I plan lessons in a variety of ways. Um, I make students talk about what they've learned. Because if you can talk about it, you know it. Um, and while we work out of books and we have to study, I just try to find any way I can to make whatever knowledge I'm gonna give stick. Also, I just love my kids. I think if you love your students, they'll do anything you ask. So that's what I try to do. Every day my instruction begins with just a lot of love in the sense of, um, I want my kids to do the best. So I think I'm a big encourager of them. I think I'm there for them. I think that, um, you know, whatever difficulties they're having, they know that they can come to me. So they know that it's a place, I'm a nurturer. I, I would say that, I'm a definitely, I'm a nurturer, I'm a mom. And then, so I think also, you know, I'm a mom in the classroom. So I think that kind of influences how I teach. I would like people to 
understand that we in the schools could use more help. And that help could emanate from a lot of sources. I would love it if somehow this could happen legally where certain corporations that have a little extra money um, could adopt us, could adopt more schools, ask us what we need, help us get more computers, um, help us with the technology. I would, I would wish too that uh, parents and communities would get even more involved. I think that, that one offshoot of that that's really working is um, the charter model. The charter model is working for a lot of communities, um, for not all, but for many. And um, That's a model where everybody is involved and that's what we need. Providing resources for classroom instruction is really the number one thing that should happen. When doing that, at the same time, you can evaluate the quality of teachers. And, and I think that a lot of those things are the things that sometimes get pushed aside when education policy comes down. We get told we have to give certain tests and certain assessments and are not given the resources to be able to successfully really prepare our students for that. Miss Judy Clevins is one of my favorite teachers of all time. She taught us how to do every aspect of theater, from the sound of the lights to the programs to the acting to the singing and dancing. And each one of us had to do one of those tasks at one point. So by the time that we emerged from really a program that she had created, not just coursework, we could do it all. Dr. Uh, Prudencia Jacobs was my mentor teacher. She's my lead teacher special ed this year. She's been awesome with helping me um, figure my way out um, through education. Jermaine Jackson, um, I met her at Terry Mill with Rhonda Kelly and Phyllis Gresham. Those are three dynamic ladies that have helped me along the way of education. I've worked with great teachers here at Clifton, um, Team Excel, we call ourselves Team Excel for special education, but just every teacher here, the lower grades, the upper grades, the special education teacher, they all have been um, a true blessing, inspirational to me, um, to just help me lead my way through education because I can't do it by myself. And as I previously, uh, previously mentioned, my mother was always my number one mentor teacher. So a lot of credit goes to her as well. As a kid in the third grade, I, was a, I grew up having ADHD in the 80s when not many people understood it. Uh, and I had a third grade teacher who believed in me. Uh, that's when we had track, the track system where you were a smart kid, you were on the highest track, uh, you were not so smart, you are on the lowest track. She took me from the lowest track and put me on the highest track. That changed education for me. Her putting me on that highest track, her believing that I could do, uh, that all worked. So when I decided I was gonna be a teacher in college, I knew what type of person I wanted to be. I wanted to make sure I touched lives the way Mrs. Flowers inspired me. I wanted to make sure that no student ever felt the way I felt when I first started college. I wanted to make sure that students always felt comfortable, they felt loved, and they knew that they had support. One of the teachers I, I have to talk about is, uh, is Mr. Anderson, who when I was in school was also my cross country and track coach, uh, and he was a science teacher as well. Um, he really is a role model for me and someone I still am in contact with today. Um, you know, he was the teacher I wanted to be like when I was in, in high school. Um, he first really got me passionate about the sport that I ended up playing in high school and college and now coach here, which is cross country. But he also came up with a lot of interactive activities for a subject I didn't really like very much, which was science. And I'm not a science whiz by any, by any means, but he was someone who approached every lesson with, today we're gonna have fun and we're also gonna learn a lot and those don't need to be mutually exclusive. We can do both and we can see the value in what we're learning, but we can have an enjoyable time doing that. I was always like a great, well, I wouldn't say great, but I was always like a really good student. I'm like, like hey. Um, I was always a good student. I, I did well in school, um, but the thing about school was I just kind of, I did well. So, you know, I got good grades and that was fine all throughout high school. So, you know, I got into college and but I think once I got to college, that really kind of opened my mind, and I really, for the first time, really started working hard. Um, but I would say also that the reason I chose the university that I did was actually because of my high school English teacher, um, Miss Wilkerson. And um, she taught me, and she exposed me to Toni Morrison. 
who wrote Song of Solomon. Once I read Song of Solomon, I was like, that's it. This is amazing. This is like two books in one. This is the most incredible piece of literature I had ever read at that point. And once I found out that Toni Morrison went to Howard, I was like, oh, I have to go to Howard too. And I'm a DC girl, I'm from Maryland. So I was like, well, that was perfect. But um, I think her influence on me, just with the writing, Miss Wilkerson just kind of like showing me that there was this other world out there that I had never been exposed to. Um, I think always kind of resonated with me and stayed with me. And I mean, I attribute the fact that I got to attend Howard to her, and then which really, I think, opened the door in um, exposing me to education, great minds, great things, great professors. I had a lot of fabulous professors. And I remember one time um, in college, I remember my professor, Dr. Shrek, said to me, make sure you choose a career that you would do for free. And, um, you know, I absolutely have done that. I absolutely have done that. Um, teaching is just something I'm just really passionate about. I really care about the kids. And um, I'm just very thankful that I get to do this every day. And I think a lot of teachers, you know, you do spend a lot of your time outside of your paycheck hours, you know, working with students, um, you know, planning, that kind of thing. We do that all the time. So it's something definitely I'm very passionate about and um, just very excited about and, you know, feel blessed that I get to do it every day. I look at where they started when I first got them to where they are now. Some of the students that I've um, worked with, um, not just this year, but in the past, um, some did not know how to write. Some did not feel good about themselves. Some were not encouraged to even want to go to school. And so now looking back, um, keeping in contact with some of the parents of the students who are now high school students, looking at how successful they are brings me success to just let me know that I've reached someone, touched someone's life, and was part of their life to encourage them. My joy is when I come to school to work, um, every morning and I see these bright faces wanting hugs, wanting someone to smile, wanting someone to depend on and that gives me joy um, to know that I can have some type of influence over their lives. I think I measure my success through my students. Uh, you know I always say that a teacher is only as good as their students and what their students are learning and I think what I've tried to do throughout my career is really evaluate myself on a daily and even hourly basis. Are my students getting the content? If not, why not? Generally, there's a little bit of blame on the students, but most of that blame is on me. I've got to adapt to them. Uh, I don't think a good teacher goes into a class and says, this is the one way I teach and that's it, my way or the highway. I don't think that works very well. I think a teacher has to go in, read their students, know what drives them, what motivates them, and adapt their teaching style doesn't mean reinventing yourself as a new teacher for every class, but it means playing to their strengths. If I have a class that really does well with group work, I'm going to provide them with group opportunities. If I have a class that deals more with a structured learning environment, then we'll do more of that. And I think that is really what a good teacher should do, is be able to adapt to their students to get the best out of them and also still challenge them in a rigorous uh, environment. A lot of the students, um, they come with different strengths and weaknesses and I have to find different ways, unique ways to reach them, to teach them. We have to clap, we have to dance, we have to sing, whatever it takes. We have to deal with the child, not only academically with paper and pencil, but we have to help build the child's character, their self-esteem. We have to motivate them, we have to encourage them. We have to do a lot of things to get the child ready to learn, wanting to learn. Um, and just being part of the learning process. All of this is just amazing. It's an amazing honor for me to be recognized, but it's an amazing honor for me to be able to be with children every day because I enjoy it. It's an honor for these parents to trust me with their children every day. And it's an honor even when things are difficult for the children to know that if they're with me, everything will be okay. That they know they're gonna learn all they need to know. They know that they don't have to worry about being hungry. They know that what I have, they have. And I think oftentimes in those rough days, I have to remember that because this is not to be taken lightly. Uh, it's a gift to be able just to talk to others. But to be able to teach is an amazing ability. And I'm just, like I said, honored and blessed to be able to have students and to be able to talk with young people every day, regardless if they're in my classroom or not just to be able to be with them every day and help shape the rest of their lives. Although Teacher of the Year is decided by faculty vote, honestly, I'm 
much more inclined to measure my success by what my students say about me. And at the end of every semester, I have them write a short piece where they talk about the things that they enjoyed about the class the most and the things that they didn't. And I have them staple them, and I tell them truthfully that I'm not going to read them until after grades are posted so they can be as candid as they want to be. I would just measure in the sense of have my students make gains, have my students make progress from where they came to me in the beginning whether they were weak in math or they were weak in reading. Um, did they make progress? And are they learning? Are they happy? Do they seem like you know, they enjoy coming to class every day? Those are the kind of things that are significant to me. I mean, yes, ideally I'd like 100% passage on every test and all my students are achieving and doing well on benchmarks and all that stuff, but is that gonna always happen? No. But are my students making gains? And that's what I'm looking for. Are my students able to, um, if not read on grade level, did they make some strides from where they were. Did they come up from maybe a first grade level, maybe to a second or third grade level? Those are the kind of things that I'm looking for, because those are the kind of you know students that I have. I want my students to leave my class smarter than when they came in, and that's that's a barometer that I always use. And I ask students that on the last day of school: Are you smarter than when you came in? Do you know more about reading and writing and speaking than you did when you entered? Um, and I also ask students to come back and tell me what of our class they use the most. I really think that I've got um, some really great, amazing students who are gonna do really wonderful things, so I'm excited to see what that future looks like for them. I would hope, above all, that what these students 20 years from now take from my class is a respect for the power of the word. Whether that word is written or spoken or sung, I want them to feel as if words really do carry power with them and that they improved in their rhetorical facility to where they could speak for themselves, to where they could interpret bias from something that they're reading, to where they could uh, go into a job interview and feel comfortable, where words hopefully became not as intimidating to them, where they were able to take apart words from Latin and Greek bases and, and, and see what they mean, where language is, is less of a mystery and it's not something that is only uh, open to the wealthy or privileged. These are the things that I'm really committed to as an English teacher is I just want to make my students more literate. So I would really hope that they would say that I helped to push them along that path of literacy. I hope that they say Mr. Minor was at my wedding. I hope that they say Mr. Minor hugged me at my mother's funeral or hugged me at my father's funeral. I hope they say Mr. Minor was there for every big event in my life because I want to be. They've been around for all the big events in my life. So I want to try to, at the very least, do the same for them.